Picture this. The early solar system isn't a calm family portrait. It's a demolition derby with better lighting. The sun has just fired up nuclear fusion. A disk of dust and gas spins around it like a cosmic pottery wheel, and half-baked worlds, hot, hungry, and unstable, keep elbowing each other for elbow room. In that chaos, a not-quite planet about the size of Mars forms on a nearby lane. It doesn't get a name for a few billion years, but we'll use the one scientists eventually give it, Theia. You could think of Theia as the planet that almost became Earth, because if the story had tilted just a few degrees differently, we'd be telling tales from a very alien shoreline, or not telling tales at all. Theia is born from the same ingredients as proto-Earth. Silicates, metals, water-bearing minerals, the dust of ancient stars. Both worlds are latecomers in a neighborhood still swarming with shrapnel. Gravity keeps introducing them to one another, not gently. And after a long courtship of resonances and nudges, they collide. Not a fender bender. A world-ending, world-making impact that liquefies rock, sprays a fan of incandescent debris into orbit, and briefly turns the sky into a foundry. It's the worst day either body will ever have, and it's the day our story really starts. In the old text, Textbooks, the moon is a leftover hunk of Earth. In the more modern script, the moon is an orphaned blend of both parents, Thea and Proto-Earth, stirred, splashed, and then assembled from a disk of vaporized rock. That matters because the moon isn't just a nightlight with phases. It's a structural beam in Earth's house. Its gravity locks our planet's axial tilt into a relatively narrow range, damping wild wobbles that would have sent climate careening between desert planet and snowball. Remove the moon, and you don't just dim the evenings, you make the seasons feral. Keep the moon, and you buy geologic time. The long, slow steadiness, in which biology can try ideas, fail, and try better ones. The impact also does something alchemical to Earth's insides. It stirs the mantle, helps segregate the heavy core, and may set the stage for the magnetic field that would later act like a planetary sunblock. A magnetic field won't stop photons, nothing stops light, but it will shepherd charged solar particles away from the upper atmosphere, keeping our sky thick and our water mostly at home. You can watch the counterexample a few steps outward. Mars, smaller and geologically early to bed, lost its global magnetic field, then its air, then its surface water. Today, it keeps its lakes as rumors in rocks and ice. The desert that almost became a coastline is a cautionary tale we can see with telescopes. Meanwhile, inside the orbit of Mars, the debris ring from the impact cools. Pebbles become boulders, become moonlets, and those merge to become the single companion that has chased us ever since. For a while, the moon is much closer than you're picturing, a swollen disk ruling a tide so tall it drags continents around by the roots. The days are five or six hours long. Sunrises are abrupt. The newly crusted world exhales steam into a sky thick with volcanic breath. If you could stand somewhere safe and watch, you'd feel cheated by the word moonrise. This isn't an ornament. It's a gravitational engine. Over hundreds of millions of years, tides transfer angular momentum. The moon glides outward, and our days lengthen to something your circadian rhythm would recognize. Now pivot the camera to Earth's closest frenemy, Venus. It's our twin in size and bulk, wrapped in a warm haze, sitting just a little closer to the sun than we do. For a long time, science fiction gave Venus oceans and jungles, as if geography were destiny. Reality is meaner. Venus wears a pressure cooker atmosphere and runs a planetary greenhouse strong enough to melt lead. The same basic ingredients, rock, iron, carbon dioxide, water, get arranged by different timing and feedbacks into two stories with opposite endings. On Earth, early oceans and a silicate weathering thermostat pull CO2 out of the sky and lock it in rock, while biology later turbocharges that process. On Venus, something stalls. Maybe it never cools enough to condense long-lived oceans. Maybe its water gets split by sunlight and hydrogen leaks to space. Maybe the crust behaves as a lid that never quite breaks into mobile plates. You can keep playing this game of near misses. Mars is the planet that almost remained Earth-like, a smaller sibling that cooled too fast, let its core solidify, and couldn't hang on to a sky thick enough to keep lakes liquid for long. The asteroid belt is the planet that never formed. Jupiter's bullying gravity stirred the cradle too hard and scattered the toys. Mercury is the planet that got stripped, a world with a core too big for its shell, maybe the survivor of impacts that blew its early mantle to space. We live within a chain of almost, and that chain says something soft but serious about luck. Our address isn't an accident, but it isn't guaranteed either. Back on the home world, the crust finally thins and cracks into plates, setting up the conveyor belt of tectonics. This is the unsung hero of habitability. Plate tectonics is a recycling program for continents and climate. Subduct an ocean plate beneath a continent, and you drag water and carbon down into the mantle. Melt rises and feeds volcanoes, fresh rock weathers and scrubs, CO2 when mountains uplift into rain. It's 
It's chemistry done at mountain scale. The result is a thermostat with patience. Without it, you get extremes, a world that locks into ice or cooks its seas off. With it, you get a planet willing to host mistakes, evolution's currency. By now, you can feel the through line. Thea didn't just help make the moon. Thea helped make a world that could keep trying. There's a version of events where that impact doesn't happen, or it happens off-angle, or it hits too late to matter. There's a version where we end up as Venus with better sunsets, or Mars with a nicer color palette. We got the version with a moon that steadies seasons and stirs tides, a magnetic shield that guards air and ocean, and a crust that won't sit still. The headline, the planet that almost became Earth, isn't about Theia only. It's about every fork in the road where the physics could have picked a different phrase. Let's zoom further out for a second and talk choreography. Planetary systems are shaped by a kind of social physics. Giants set the beat, small worlds dance in whatever space the giants leave, and everything that doesn't find a stable step gets kicked off the floor. The biggest dancer in our story is Jupiter. Early on, it may have cruised inward toward the sun, and then back outward, an idea called migration, sculpting the asteroid belt, protecting the inner system from some comets while flinging others at us with careless generosity. With the right timing, Jupiter helps the inner worlds grow orderly. With the wrong timing, it swats them to rubble. The fact that Earth is still here to gossip suggests we enjoyed more shielding than smacking. Now the part that feels like magic until you name it, time. The universe offers plenty of habitable moments. It's stingier, with habitable stretches. Life needs a long lease, hundreds of millions of years to move from chemistry to cells, billions to walk out of the sea and start naming things. Earth's special trick wasn't conjuring oceans or inventing continents. Plenty of exoplanets likely manage that. Our trick was holding the stage long enough for the cast to learn its lines. A stable tilt, a slow day, a loyal moon, a restless crust, a decent magnetic field, and an atmosphere that never left. None of those are unique by law. Try this. Habitability isn't a product. It's a process. You don't order an Earth from a catalog. You apprentice a world to heat and water, spin and stone, and see if it learns the craft. Thea was part of our apprenticeship, a harsh teacher with a good syllabus. So was the late heavy bombardment. If it truly happened as crisply as old models say, a tantrum of stray debris that sterilized surfaces and then, paradoxically, may have delivered volatiles and nutrients. So were the oxygenation events that stressed the biosphere before they enabled big, complicated bodies with bones that could stride. And then, a turn you might not expect in a story so rocky. Life starts rewriting geology. Microbes learn to eat rock and breathe metal. Mats of cyanobacteria exhale oxygen and rust the planet. Forests yank carbon from the air and stack it into trunks and soils. Biology becomes a climate agency, a geomorphic force, a planetary feedback. The planet that almost became Earth collides. The moon coheres. The field flickers on. The plates begin to roam. And then life does what only life does. It hacks the rules, gently, until the rules fit it better. It's tempting to personify those lucky breaks, to call Thea a sacrifice, the moon a guardian, Jupiter a wise uncle. There's poetry in that, but the science is quieter and more durable. The inner solar system was a maze, and we walked it by accident and law. Pile up enough small shoves and you get a world where liquid water can persist at the surface for billions of years under a sky regular enough for creatures to plan against. And if somewhere out there another planet almost becomes an Earth, the story will rhyme, not repeat. Maybe its moon is a double. Maybe its tilt is quiet without help. Maybe its seas are green with chemistries we never invented. The details are free to wander. The structure is stubborn, collisions that prune and seed, fields that shield, cycles that regulate, patience that lets mistakes survive long enough to learn. That's what an Earth is, not a place, a tempo.